Well, hello, boys and girls. Here we are when we feel like at the clock. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And uh, we've been doing a series uh, this last little while on every single team and their free agency and offseason and how it projects for their future or what it shows that they're doing for their future. Um, and, uh, of course, we have John from Off the Wall Hockey here. He's, uh, he's one of the finest in the land. I just love him. Does uh, so I got to know him doing his live stuff that he did in the playoffs. Also watched a lot of his videos even before that, and uh, reached out to him a little while ago. And next thing you know, we're on we're we're partners now at yeah. www.steelflyers.com. So we're we're partners in crime here. But uh, so we've been doing videos before. It ain't gonna stop now. Now we're gonna be looking at. Um, I can't remember the last week we did uh, call. time we did a video did we do it like was that our colorado the last one we did i don't know we did so many but we're doing yeah. nashville today i yeah. think it was colorado colorado um we're doing so check that out and check out all his fine work what's the last one you did there it was pretty cool i think you did a nashville one yeah oh, the we... last thing i did was uh, my own off-season recap with another youtuber slapshot jack um we looked at nashville yeah. and their off-season so far so uh nashville's fresh in my head i'm ready to go for this one yeah, and check out that series. He just went out and got a whole lot of YouTubers that are do Chicago. One of the – what's his name? Windy City. Windy City Hockey for Chicago, yep. Windy City Hockey. That was a great one. And he got a whole bunch of YouTubers that – and each one of them did a team. I did one. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll see. <laughs> but you go over there and subscribe to John. That was great. So let's get into Nashville. Some of, they made a lot of interesting moves this year. Um, I don't know how much it tells us where we're going for the future with the moves that they did. But uh, what do we? What's what's the what's the future favorite move that Nashville did this year? If you have a favorite, there, John. Oh well, um, it's been interesting for Nashville. They've they've kind of sat back a little bit but i think that's going to change and i i'm sure we're going to get into that with mike hoffman coming up but th that hasn't happened yet so throwing that aside um i i really like that they drafted askarov at 11 overall um this kid is projected to be one of the best goaltenders that we've seen his, his the, you know when he was a prospect they were comparing him to carry price so uh, when you're at that level, you're you're looking at a incredibly good goaltending prospect, and we know that Pekarene is now 38 years old. He's he's nearing the end of his career, and if they could, you know, re, as Rena goes out, if Askarov comes in, that could really set them up in goal for a long, long time. If Askarov becomes the goaltender that he's projected to be, goalies are always kind of coin flips when it comes to that. Some of them, like Mark Andre Fleury and Carey Price, work out very, very well. And then sometimes you get the Rick DiPietros of the world who are drafted extremely high and don't. So we'll see with Askarov, but I really like that move of them taking a goaltender there, knowing that Kerry, uh, that um, Pecorine is nearing the end of his career. And I think one of the more underrated moves was the signing of Mark Borvietsky, who's going to come in and play on their third defense pair. And that third D pair was a problem for the Nashville Predators last season. When Obviously, we know their top four. They've got Yossi and Ellis at, at the top of that decor. They've got Ekholm. They've got Fabro, who's only 22 years old, coming up and playing next to Ekholm on the right side. But then that third pair last year was kind of a disaster you had dan ham hughes who he's retired now it was his final season and he did not play all that well you had guys like matt irwin and yannick weber and they traded irwin for Cor corbinian holzer and you just kind of had this mishmash of guys on the bottom pair all who weren't really very good so i think what they did going out and getting mark borvietsky who's been with the ottawa senators now for a number of years brings toughness um, a lot of physicality and a good hard-nosed veteran player to that bottom pair to really kind of anchor that and then you know they brought in uh, matthew benning as well good you know bottom pair guy so i really think they fixed that bottom pair 
defense, which was a big problem last year. And the Borvietsky move in particular, he's a guy that I really like a lot, and I like that move. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, those are that particularly what they did with their defense to me was the favorite thing they did. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, Matthew Benning, uh, being an Oilers fan myself, uh, he is he could be a top four actually. He still has some upside to to go, and they got him for a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Like that was a really good play. Uh, Mark Borieki, uh definitely an upgrade over all of the, the people Irwin and Holzer and all of that stuff. Uh, I think that might have been one of their biggest problems last year is just putting too much pressure, and uh, especially going into a condensed season, you wouldn't want to have the top four putting up the kind of minutes they were doing. Not to mention Dante Fabro kind of took a, they said, took a step back. To me, he just was a 21-year-old defenseman in the yeah. league. That's really all he was. And he was given a lot of work. And he, I think he did really well considering. But it's not something ideally you want to do to a 21-year-old guy, even though he is he looks like he's going to be okay. He's going to come through it and be okay. But um, having Boriaki and Benning, is a big move for sure and for them. Okay, so let's look at uh, one of my favorite moves, actually, was uh, trading Benino, who I like Benino. I mean, solid guy, but getting Kunin. Yeah, yeah. Like, what a slick little move that is, eh? I I agree. I like Luke Kunin a lot. Um, This kid uh, came up with Minnesota, um, 22 years old, he can he I like him better on the wing. Um, he's he's listed as a center or a wing. He can play both, but I like him better on the wing. I think his play style is much better fit for a winger as opposed to a center. And he's a good, hard nosed, young power forward who brings good scoring ability and is not afraid to get in your face and play physically either. And I mean, my plays my kind of hockey to a T. I. I really, really like this kid. He had 15 goals and 31 points in 63 games last year with the Wild, and he had 55 penalty minutes on top of that. He's not afraid to drop the gloves. And I think he's a guy that right now slots in so well on a third line to be a third line right wing. And I think he has the potential as he develops to really grow into that top six winger in, in power forward kind of kind of along the same lines as like a Tyler Bertuzzi in Detroit. I think they're pretty similar style players. And and Kunin, I think, has the upward potential to reach to be a 25-goal, 50-point type guy who could play on your second line and then add in, you know, 50 to 75 penalty minutes in there every year as well and, and just bring that physicality and that that willingness to, to get involved physically as well. So I'm a huge fan of Luke Kuhn, and, and um, I think that was a very good move for for the for the Predators who were trying to get younger. Um, he, he's 22. Benino was 30-plus, who they sent out. Benino had a really good year last year, so they got rid of him when his value was high. He had 18 goals last season, uh, which is a lot for a third-line center like Nick Benino. And um, he 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 was second on the team tied with Craig Smith goals last year. And, and he brings a great defensive game as well. So uh, for them to be able to pull Coonan out of Minnesota while giving up a, you know, a 30 plus year old guy, I think is a great move for for the Preds. And this is a kid that I like a lot who still has a lot of upwards potential left to go at the NHL level. And I just, I love his game. His style of game is one of my favorites in the league. Just that, that hard nosed power forward who can score and add the physicality as well. Yeah. I'm a little confused. Um, I'd heard now rumors of Coonan being traded. I don't know if there's a maturity issue in the room or something like that. All I can see is what I see on the ice and, I mean, he had 31 points in 63 games as a 22-year-old last year for Minnesota. This is a perplexing move for me uh, for, for in Minnesota's yeah. sta- from Minnesota's standpoint. Getting Benito, he's like 33 or 30. I could maybe – I don't even know. I could even be older. But um, I don't really know what Minnesota's doing. 
but Poil plucking, I, I, I'm just going to say that. I yeah. only can imagine he did something stupid in the offseason. There's a reason why they don't. All I know, he could, this could be like another Alex Tuck for them. They gave him up to Vegas, and now they're going to give up Kunin to Nashville, and they could, they could look, really look bad. But, you know, kudos to Poil for, and this is the reason why Poil just keeps on rolling. His, yep. career, his career just keeps on going because he makes these little moves, um, you know, besides the Ryan Johansson trade aside, most of the moves that he makes are effective. Um, this, things haven't really worked out in a lot of ways recently. Could change with a move like that, though. And uh, so let's get into the what you kind of precursored into when we first started here. Uh, we one of the one of the most important things and most talked about things going on in the league right now, of course, is the cap space of each team. It's probably the most important thing that a team can have right now with the cap not going up for flat cap and all that. Mm -hmm. And here's Nashville after making nice little moves like Kunin and bringing in some guys over a million dollars for Benny and Boriecki, what cost two million for two years. I think that's solid value for that. And uh, in doing so, have twelve million dollars. I think they brought Richardson in for a million. Yeah. Uh, Nick uh, Nick Cousins was that a trade? You know what? I can't remember. Did they sign him up? Uh, I thought that was a pretty good deal too for a twenty-seven year old guy at one point five million dollars. It's not bad. He's been good everywhere he's gone, but he's got they got twelve million dollars in calf space, brother. Yes. And there's uh, a a little a lot of time left before this season's over. Uh, I'm pretty sure, I think Utah, I watched the video. Everybody needs to go there and watch the video. We talked. To, you talked about Granlin, and he's still a free agent, and uh, possibly uh, you know, could come back, but I think his I time in Nashville so. is definitely over. There might be some other people that they might be looking at with that kind of, kind of money, though. What, what, what would you say there, buddy? <laughs> Mike Hoffman. Yes. Mike Hoffman would be a golden fit in Nashville. Looking at this roster, looking at their cap situation, Luke Coonan is an RFA. He's going to get a deal. It will probably be two, two and a half million a year. They're still going to have like $10 million in cap space to work with. The cap is not an issue this coming season for the Nashville Predators at all. When I look at this lineup, you've got the one two punch down the middle of Ryan Johansson and Matt Duchesne. Both of them had bad seasons last year. Not just down seasons, they had bad seasons last year. They have got to get those two guys going. How do you get centers going? You give them high-level goal scorers to put the puck in the net and set up. And we know they have Philip Forsberg. Forsberg had another 20-plus goal season last year. He's going to be your top-line left wing. When I look at the right wings on this team, you're looking at Victor Arvidsson, you're looking at Colton Sissons, you're looking at uh, Rocco Grimaldi, who can play both sides, you're looking at Luke Coonan. You've got a lot of wingers that can play both sides. Mike Hoffman is another guy to me that can play both sides. He's, he's a left shot, he's a left winger first and foremost, but I think you could play him on the right side and he would still score 25 to 30 goals. And when I look at the just the wingers in general with what they're able to produce, Mike Hoffman is a guy who can legitimately score 30 goals any season in the NHL. Other than Philip Forsberg, I don't see a consistent 30-goal guy on this team. Victor Arvidsson had a tough year last year because of injury. He's scored 30 in the past. I look at him more of kind of a 25-goal type guy. Even then, when you take Forsberg and Arvidsson, who are probably their two best wings out, outside of that, they don't have goal scoring on the wings. You've got Cali Yonkroak, you've got Rocco Grimaldi. Those are kind of third-line guys, in my opinion. They don't really have that second-line winger. They don't have more top-six wingers outside of Arvidsson and Forsberg right now. Mike Hoffman being a legitimate top-six scorer in the NHL would be a perfect fit for the Predators lineup to play with either Duchesne or Johansson. And you can, you, it's your pick. You can have whoever you want setting him up. And 
and they have the cap space to do it. So it just makes all the sense in the world for Nashville to be one of those teams at the top of the list trying to go out and get Mike Hoffman right now. Yeah, for sure. And I do believe Matt Duchesne played with Hoffman in Ottawa, right? In so, Ottawa. So there, I if, if I were to take a list, I would say Nashville's got to be top of the list. It's Nashville's to lose here. I don't know Hoffman's lifestyle situation or what he wants looking for a lifestyle or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, I just have a feeling Duchesne's chomping on his ear quite a bit. Uh, I'm sure he's trying to get as much, uh, like Duchesne is probably talking to him quite a bit to come over. Uh, why wouldn't you want to have yeah. a guy, uh, especially a high percentage shooter like that and something that uh, you kind of brought up about a score. There's something to be said about high percentage shooters like Hoffman. Because when the team's not scoring, and Nashville certainly had a trouble scoring last year, yes, it's nice to have these guys that are able to score and at that percentage. Like mm -hmm. when you're down and not scoring, Hoffman can pot two on three shots. You yep. know? And that brings up a team quite a bit. And the other thing about Hoffman is he doesn't really have – He's a he's a guy that – um, brings it into the zone and shoots it a lot. He doesn't mm -hmm. necessarily have to have a great center, but it sure helps to have a great center. So I, I think you're absolutely right there. I would be, I would give it 75% chance that Nashville ponies up to do for Hoffman before the season's up. I think the only thing stopping them right now, probably Columbus is out there on the phone. Yeah. Um, they got some room. They could use a score like that. And, and him and his agent are trying to get him as much money as possible. Uh, but uh, that would be – and if you do put Hoffman in there, now you put Yarncroc down and uh, on the third line, which is where he's more likely to be put, uh, yep. where, where he's better to play. Yes. And you got a pretty solid Yarncroc, Sissons, and Grimaldi. I love Grimaldi. I love these – five, six guys that play like he does. Just He's always in there all the time in the corners and doesn't back down from anybody. Um, can, can put up some points. And I, another guy we wanted, I, we kind of talked about before the show, and uh, which would put, by the way, Cousins down on the fourth line, which is, I think, a better spot for him too. And you got a really good line of Cousins, Richardson, and a guy that we talked about a little bit, um, we kind of explored a little bit was Matthew Olivier. He is an interesting character, isn't he? Uh, he, he played in junior, as, is one of those guys, kind of a throwback guy, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Matthew Olivier is an interesting guy. I didn't even realize he got NHL games last year until I looked at him when we were before doing this video. Um, he played eight games in the NHL last year and had one assist, but. Uh, he is, I, he's a guy that I've been, uh, I've been kind of having an eye on for the past few seasons because he's such a throwback style player that you just don't see anymore in the, in not just the NHL, but pretty much anywhere. Um, this kid is a big, tough guy who can also add some, some scoring. In, and I think that's the big question with him. You know, if he is ever going to make the jump to be an NHL player, is it, can he bring the offense? Because the days of just having, you know, a, a big lug who can throw punches on the fourth line are over. Um, mm -hmm. it, you just, that those players are gone from the NHL. They don't, if you're going to play in the NHL, you have to be able to contribute offensively and you have to be able to skate. And, it, you know, the 6'5", 230 guys who just, you know, have two points a year and have 150 penalty minutes are all gone from the league at this point. Yeah. So Matthew Olivier is a really tough kid. He's been he was one of the top fighters in the Quebec Major Junior League. Uh, he's been one of the top fighters in the AHL for the past couple of seasons. Um, he's 6'2", 210 pounds, not afraid of anybody. But. The thing with him with with Nashville is that they traded away Austin Watson and Austin yeah. Watson was kind of the big, beefy, tough guy that they had on their fourth line for the past number of seasons now. Um, but in Austin Watson could provide offense as well. He could chip in 10 to 15 goals and 20 points. And and he was that modern tough guy in the NHL who would fight five or six times a year and also chip in, you know, 20 or so points. The. I want to see if Matthew Olivier can become that kind of player. If he can earn a fourth line spot at the NHL level, being a guy who can 
you know, go into the corners, play physically, you know, drop the gloves when he needs to. But he had 10 goals in the AHL last year, 19 points in 56 games while having 95 penalty minutes as well. It's a it's going to be interesting to see if this kid can bring enough offense and skate well enough at the NHL level to be a regular fourth line player in the league or if he just ends up being a career AHL guy. He's 23 years old. I've been following him for a while. I like the kid a lot. Um, it, it's going to be fun to watch if he can crack that lineup as a fourth line winger and, and and be that Austin Watson replacement for them, or if he just doesn't isn't able to bring that offense enough. Because if you're only going to score five or six points in a season, you're not going to play at the NHL level. You've got to be even on a fourth line. And we were we were talking about guys like Ryan Reeves and Matt Martin before this, who while they certainly are tough as nails and can drop the gloves with anybody, they now bring offense to the game as well, and they're able to score. I mean, we look at what Matt Martin did in the playoffs this past year for the Islanders. He scored five or six goals in the playoffs and some big goals in the playoffs. So I want to, you know, I'm, I'm just looking to see if, if Matthew Olivier can become that Matt Martin type player or if he is just destined to be a career AHLer. Yeah, I mean, I brought him up because he's kind of guy that we you love to root for, right? Absolutely. He was, he was also undrafted. Mm-hmm. He's literally fought his way up the lineup. So, um, and Nashville's really good at bringing players up. Usually more defense, no more for defensemen than not. But uh, it's underrated the players they bring up. And funny thing we do have to mention is right now. Um, Nashville really doesn't have any uh, very strong prospect pool. We we looked at it beforehand. We won't go through every player, but they don't really have anybody ready right now. So this is this is a guy who's fought his way up, wasn't drafted. They do well at um, developing players. Nashville does. It's just their pool has grown a little dry right now. So I'm really rooting for them at all as rooting for them. And I have to say, so we this is looking at their moves and where they're going in the future. Uh, where do you see Nashville five years from now? The way they are, there, is, is their window open, closing? How's that? How do you think that looks for them? Uh, I think their their window is certainly with this group starting to close. Um, I think this is a team that is it needs to be in win now mode, and uh, they're. <laughs> When you look at what they did last season, and I, if if last season had gone normally and didn't get expanded to a 2014 playoff, I don't think Na- well Nashville might have been a wild card team last year. I think they they would have been right on that line of being a, you know, just making it or just missing it last year. Um, had the season continued normally, obviously once it got expanded to 24, they were easily in to the playoffs. Um, they need to make sure you know that they're better than they were last year this coming season because this is a group that is certainly ready to win now you look at a lot of their core players ryan johansson is 28 matt duchene is 29 philip forsberg is 26 victor arvidson is 27 roman yossi is 30 ryan ellis is 29 matthias ekholm is 30 you're in that prime spot where your core players are in their late 20s or early 30s. You need to be winning now. And then you brought up the prospect pool. They, uh, you know, they've got Philip Tomasino coming up. Maybe Luke Evangelista down the line. Um, Jeremy Davies is really the only name as far as young defenseman that stands out to me that they have. So they only don't. Tol- only Tolvanen. Yeah, Tolvanen str- hasn't struggle. really worked out so far. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is a team that needs to win now. And um, because, you know, once this core is, is getting up there in age and moving on, they're, they're probably going to need to retool or rebuild at some point down the line. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and I think with all the ages you gave there and the fact that this is really their core, there's mm-hmm. not, you know, uh, if they have another bad season, I think you could see maybe some changes going on in Nashville pretty it, darn quick. Uh, it would be blow up time if they have another bad season. I I agree with you totally. I also wanted to mention you brought up Askarov. I personally think Askarov ten years from now when we look back will be the best player from this draft. So just that's personally what I think will happen. Yeah. So, but 
you are freaking awesome, dude. I love working with you, man. Thank you for all that. Um, it's funny how we seem to be on the same page with most of the stuff. The only thing that's uh, difficult with us is we don't really disagree too. <laughs> yeah. And we have the same way of looking at things. But I hope you all enjoyed all that. We'll be doing some more down the road. I'll probably be doing some more on his. Remember www.steelflyers.com. Remember, head over to subscribe. Subscribe to my channel. Keep this ball rolling. And uh, we like it when you like it. So you can do that too. That's our full 42. That's all the pearls we got for you today. Have a great day. Lots of love to you.